Hello and welcome back to another episode of Walking Christ Show, a show where we inspire the masses to become financially free while building God's kingdom. On the show today, we have Mr. Mark McCair. I said that's McIver. it. McIver. We have Mr. Mark McIver. <laughs> Mr. Mark is a highly successful barber and entrepreneur known for his extensive client list, which includes LeBron James, Stormy Z, and he has built a global recognized brand, Slider Cutch, which stays true to his Christian faith while empowering other student mentorship and sharing valuable business insight. In this episode, we're going to discuss Mr. Mark and how he has built a successful barbership business. So thank you for being here, Mr. Mark. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. You know, it's been a good um, hot day. So um, yeah, and the last day of the summer holidays. So my children are back in school tomorrow. Wow, 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 wow. That's really great. Yeah, it's definitely hot out here in New York City um, as well. So I, I could definitely express that same feeling. But to get started in this conversation, you know, I want to add, you know, how did you get started as a barber? Well, that was because of, you could say, poverty. My mom couldn't afford for me to go to the barber shop. So she would cut my hair or my brothers would cut my hair and I just wanted a good haircut. And unfortunately, the haircuts I was getting, I didn't feel they were good. So one day I just decided to pick up the trimmers and the clippers or the clippers myself and try and give myself a haircut. And that's essentially how it started. You know, the haircut wasn't good. It was horrible. It was rubbish. I had to cut all my hair off. But then, you know, the next haircut, when my hair grew out, we still didn't have any money to go to the barber shop. So, you know, I tried again, it went wrong. Then I tried again, it went wrong, but got better. I tried again, it went wrong, but got better. And then, you know, slowly, progressively over time, I was just getting better. And then suddenly my little cousin started living with me from Nigeria and I started cutting his hair. You know, I was enjoying it. Then I started cutting people in my area. Then before he knew it, I was cutting loads of people around where I lived. And that's when I got a, uh, job in a barbershop when I was about 18 years old so when I started I was about 13 14 and I got a job at 18 because people were say, telling me that I was good you know so I could work in a barbershop wow wow oh wow that's um, pretty impressive because I can relate to that um that's for my dad you know a Nigerian my dad he would cut our hair because he didn't think he didn't see the point of me and us going to the barbershop and paying. yeah <laughs> I reply. So he would cut it and go into school, um, in my case, going to school and get made fun of where the hairline was not straight enough. Uh, there's like yeah. a bad, uh, was yep. very frustrated. Uh, but in my situation, what happened, one of my younger brothers had spoke up about it, like, okay, we're done with you cutting our hair. And <laughs> <laughs> that was the conversation. It was just triple, like, and we all like, yeah, we're done with you cutting our hair. So him and mom came to the baby that, you know, they're going to give us money. Uh, I think it was like, it was like middle school, middle school, high school. Later, they would give us money to go and get a haircut. And at that time, hair cost like 10 to $15 um, here in the United States. And that's literally how we got of, you know, the bad haircut getting made fun of. Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that, if a hair get messed up, it was just like, cut it off, cut it off. Yeah. Like, so it was just like, so I, I definitely understand that. Um, I want to ask, because, you know, during that age of 14, 18, you know, I can imagine that you felt felt like giving up, you know, felt like, you know, you I mean, just need to get money. Like, you know, like you can look for other options, whether it's to gain money, you know, but what made you continue trying to focus on bettering your skills as a barber at such a young age? Well, the reason behind, you know, me just continuously going was because I wasn't chasing a career. Mm. I was just doing it because I enjoyed it. So I never thought at any point to give up because I never thought I was doing anything to give up on. Because I wasn't doing it as a career. I was just like, okay, you know, I'm cutting hair and I'm enjoying it. I'm cutting people in my area. I'm just enjoying it. I wasn't even charging people. It was free. So there was nothing for me to give up on. You wow. know? <laughs> Hello. So when did you start, when did you realize that this could be a career and something you can actually make business out of and start building a brand for yourself? I think that was when I was probably about, it's funny because it was probably when I was about 23, 
So I've been cutting hair for five years at this point. And that's when I decided I wanted to be a barber because when I went into working in a barbershop, I had just finished college and I didn't want to pursue what I was doing in college in university. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know what? I'll keep working in the barbershop full time until I work out what I want to do. And when I work that out, I'll go back to university and I will study it. And that was the promise I made to myself. That's pretty After, good. You know, start, pardon? I said that that's pretty good. Um, the fact that you made that promise to yourself. Um, so because oftentimes people like to go to college or university, get a degree that they won't get, to, they won't use, and go into larger depth. And but I want to ask you know, um, I can just imagine what was that conversation with your parents? Because you know. Uh, just for you doing a shop for five years and not going to university and pursuing a degree. What was that conversation like with your parents? I'm not sure if I had that conversation with my mom. I must have. Because <laughs> I, finished, I finished college. I passed. I think because I was probably active, I was working. I think, actually, now I think about it, I did tell my mom. I think I must have just told my mom that, you know, the same thing, which was, I'm going to be doing this full time now, working. I think my mom asked me, you know, am I making money from it? I must have responded, yes. <laughs> but at that time, I was still doing other things. So even with what I was studying in college, I was still doing some of those things outside of college anyway, um, in different courses. And during that period, I went back to college and I did an access course to uni to do social work, to be a social worker. I did a personal training course. I was about to do a photography course. So I was still, while I was working, experimenting and doing different things. So I held to my promise, which was, if there's something I want to do and I find it, I will go back and study it. So during that period, I was doing different things and studying different things. But around 23, 24 is when I was set that actually, do you know what? Barbering is the thing I want to do. And what was fortunate for me at that time was, very fortunate was that when I decided to be a barber, nobody knew that I had just made this step because nothing about the way I cut hair or the way I treated my business changed because I always kind of believed that in anything you were doing, you should just do it to the best of your ability. Yeah. Whether you want to be in it for one year or 50 years, like whatever you're doing, just do to your capacity. So when I decided to be a barber, nothing about my life changed. So no one saw any difference. It's not like um, it was like, oh, well, now you're starting to brand yourself and now you're starting to work hard and now you're trying to be a good barber. It's like, no, I was always doing those things there, even when I wasn't sure. So that when I decided that I wanted to be a barber, it meant that I had already built up this big client list. I'd already been working hard. I'd been focusing and studying on being a good barber as well. So this career was almost laid out for me. Uh, that's impressive. I like the fact that, you know, um, what you just said reminds me of scripture, which basically says, do all good, do all things as you're doing unto Christ. Um, it's Colossians 3, 2, 3. Colossians yes. 3, 23. Thank you for that. Um, I feel like oftentimes, you know, when people are going through like their trial, trying to figure themselves out, they just do it halfway instead of doing it purposely because you never know what opportunity can come and how God can bless you. And I want to specifically talk about that specific time when you realize, okay, this is what God was going to to barbership. You know, how did you go about branching out and start building um, your brand? Well, at that time, I just continued as normal. Yeah. So everything I was doing, I just continued doing. But then social media came out, you know, Facebook, then Twitter, then Instagram, and all the other smaller ones that maybe never succeeded. But, you know, During that period, social media started really kind of becoming a thing that everybody was on. So when I got onto it, Instagram, I was was like, well, I'll just put my haircuts up. Mm. And that's how it all started. I just put my haircuts up there. But actually, I'm lying. I've missed one step. Before social media came out, actually, I built a website for myself when I was about 24. Yeah, 24, I did a website for myself. My first website was very basic. It was one page. It just had my number, the address of where I worked, my name, and it says slider cuts, nothing else. But that website that was so bare, so kind of like, you know, simple, 
got me a lot of customers. And the reason why was because, especially in the UK, barbers never had websites for themselves, especially a barber who was working in a barbershop. Yeah. You know, but barbershops never had websites. Yeah. So I ended up being one of the first barbers. I don't know of any other barbers. There would have been, you know, probably would have been a few other barbers out there. But generally, because this was like, I'm 38 now, this was when I was 24. So this was like 2009, 2010, 2009, something like that. Wow. So I ended up being like one of the first barbers, like just in the UK, who had a website. Wow. And so what would happen is when people were going on to internet and they were Google searching barbers, this is what people used to search because I used to ask them every time I got a new client, like, you know, where did you see me? And they always used to say the same thing, you know, we searched in Google barber black London. So they're looking for a barber who could cut black hair. So just this key search is barber black London. And I'm the only one that came up. <laughs> Wow. Because no one else had a website. <laughs> you know, and that was just me. <laughs> there was no competition. <laughs> wow. Wow, oh, that's, that's, that's simple. <laughs> now, that's amazing. Because even now, you know, like, um, so a lot of barbers don't still have website, whether they're working for themselves or whether they're working in a, in a barbershop. And for you, it seemed like you was ahead of the time. You was ahead of this curve of social media. Um, and you know, using technology for your business. So I guess once you realize social media was coming to the platform, what made um uh, how did you go about using it? Did you already have this clientele a celebrity or this clientele started coming when she started getting social media? It's a mixture. I had, you know, I'd cut, you know, celebrity clients before okay. because the shop which I worked in, especially the older barber, was cutting celebrity clients. So sometimes they get passed down to me and so on. Then from word of mouth, I was getting celebrity clients. And then when social media came, I got clients from that as well. What happened with social media, what I found was social media was kind of like a, um, a verification of who you are and what you do. So now that people could recommend me, because people still recommended me, but now they can go to my social media page and check out my haircuts and then say yes or no. So I felt like, but then also I did get clients as well from social media, you know, where people just saw me on social media or come, came across my page. So, but I always tell people, you know, there was never a focus on one thing. My thing was always about just, first of all, doing the job correctly. And then from there, putting yourself out where you can. So it meant that I got clients from all different means, from social media, from, you know, the different platforms of social media to recommendations, you know, which, and some of the clients and some of the people, you know, you may name of who I've cut, some of them came from like recommendations from people, the most random people, you know, someone like in my church recommended me to do some job with someone, then suddenly I'm cutting this particular person. And that was just a recommendation just from a lady I go to church with, you know, um, or, or a random customer who was cutting in the chair. Then I remember this guy was cutting him and then about six months later, he called me up randomly because he was with J. Cole and J. Cole wanted a haircut, you know, to LeBron James. That didn't come through social media to either. That was a customer who I cut in the shop. I don't know who he is. He's just sitting there. I got to him. I cut his hair. And literally, um, that was it. Brief talk, whatever it is, what do you want done? That was it. You, you, I don't know who you are. You're, you know, you're quote unquote no one, you know. A year later, he came back to me. Because now he wants to wait for me. Because the last time he came here a year ago, I cut his hair well. So now I'm talking to him a bit more, like, you know, because he's tall, he's dark skinned, he's got a deep American voice, kind of American accent, sorry, kind of. And I'm just like, you know, oh, you know, what are you doing over here? He's, and he just told me he's from London. He moved over to America when he was 16. So at this point, he was 26 because he got a scholarship to play basketball. And he goes, he plays in the NBA. I was like, oh, okay, who do you play for? He goes, I play for the Houston Rockets. So I'm like, okay, cool. So he's just like, you know, every year he comes back to see his family. So I just cut this person randomly, you know, and now suddenly I found out, oh, he plays in the NBA. So that when the Olympics came over to London, all the players were asking, you know, is there any good barbers in London? And he was like, well, you know, I got my barber in London, London come and cut with my barber. So that was nothing to do with that was nothing to do with social media. That was to do with me doing my job correctly. Because, you know, I always tell people, you know, you're always in an interview and you never know who anybody is. 
So, you know, your best bet is just treating everybody well to the best of your ability. That way you will lose very few opportunities because if you try and wait to do good or do the right thing when you think you're doing it for the right person, the right person's around, what you'll find is you end up missing a bunch of opportunities. But if you actually just behave, period, the way you want to behave when the right person is around or is the right person and just behave that way full stop with everyone, then you won't miss any opportunities. Hey family, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. And if you are and you have yet to subscribe to us here on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. And also, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts and you have yet to leave us a five-star review, please do so. Now back to the episode. Now that's powerful. Uh, that was definitely powerful. And I guess when we ask, you know, what would you say are some good um, barbering um, practices, you know, because I have had some experience, you know, where the barber is like, they're not, they're not paying attention, you know, when you cut on your hair, you know, <laughs> uh, they talk it, this and that. You're not even engaging with you or asking anything. So what would you say is some good um, best practice for barbers in order to get recommended, you know, uh, depending on, despite who may be in the same chair? I would say acknowledge to yourself that you're a servant. I tell my barbers this all the time. Some of my barbers argue they hate the term, they hate the feeling <laughs> of being called a servant. I said, but we are servants. And they were like, no, you're a servant. I'm not no servant, but you're a servant. You could be a servant, but I'm no servant. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Cool, I'm a servant. Whatever, I don't, I don't care. I'm a servant. We are all servants. When, if you provide a service to someone, you are in service to that person, meaning you are serving that person. Ultimately, you are a servant to that person. That person's paying you to do something. If a person asks me to give them a fade, I have to give them a fade. If they ask me to cut all their hair off, I have to cut all the hair off. If they say they want to shape up, no shape up, a beard shape up, whatever it is, taper, whatever it is, I have to do that because I'm in service to that person. When you have a servant, what do they do? They serve you. So if you say to them, can you get me tea, please? They go get you tea. If you say, can you get me a coffee, a drink, food, whatever it is, they do it because they're in service to you. So I always tell people like who are barbers, the sooner you realize you're a servant, the more and the sooner your career will flourish. Mm. Serve your client. If your client wants to talk, talk. If your client doesn't want to talk, don't talk. If your client wants to fade, give them a fade. If, they, if your client has a complaint, listen to them. It's just serve your client. It's so simple, right? But it's so difficult because it hits people's price. Mm. Serve your client. Be in service to your client. Be a servant to your clients. No, that, that, you're 100%, you're 100% right about that. And, you know, uh, another question I wanted to ask, because you mentioned that, you know, the bar shot that you started at, you know, um, at 18 to 24, uh, you yeah. were getting some, you know. No, no, I worked there till about, I was till, a, I worked there from 18 till I was about 33. Okay, 18, sorry, 18 to 33. Um, so I want to, yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned, you corrected me that 18 to 33, and that's about 15, 18 years, if I'm not mistaken. About, about 16. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was 18. So it was, it was about, it was actually, it was about 15, 16 years. So 15 to 16 years. And, you know, um, I have seen that, you know, like, the one I want to say that, you know, out of, through this conversation so far, I can say that you're very humble. Um, you know, just having this conversation with you because oftentimes when people start getting this um level of the promotion, whether you know, and it's in your case, getting celebrity um bar, um celebrity clients, you know, they start to feel like they they this person, they that person, and that's when they want to move out, that's when they want to open their new shop. But what kept you like, you know, remaining a student, I would say, of being a barber and trying to perfect your craft before you took the to step out and say, you know, now's my time to do, do what I need to do. Well, first of all, you know, that's one of my things as well. If you want to master your craft, you must forever be a student of your craft. You know, it's the only way you master it, meaning it's an oxymoron to some degree, because I'm basically saying you can never master your craft. You'll always be a student of your craft, but the only way to master it is to be a student. You know, so for me, it was about honesty. Like, I'm just very honest. You know, one is about, am I actually ready? 
because people will always say to people, you know, you, you should move on, you should do this, you should do that, you know, you should go off by yourself. People, anybody that's doing well in whatever career it is, you always have people around them saying, you should go and do something yourself. And that's one, that's because a bunch of people don't understand what goes into running a business. People don't realize that if you are great at cutting hair or you're great at playing basketball or football, or, you know, you're a musician and, you know, you're a great singer and you're, in a, you're maybe you're in a popular group, right? And things are going really well for the group, you know, whatever it is, right? What you always find is people will always come and say, why are you not, why are you working with them? They're taking some of your money. You can do this yourself and not pay any. That's why, it, and it's always to do with money. Because yeah. it's always to do with the fact of, you know, there's four of you in this group, right? But you're the one that everyone comes to see. Yeah. So you should go off by yourself because, you know, that, you know, thousand pounds or if you're in america that thousand dollars is being split between four of you that's 250 dollars each you know that could be a thousand dollars for you so everyone always gets swayed and then you find a lot of people go off by themselves and their businesses fail and the reason why they fail is because a lot of people don't realize that the elements that go into making a business successful is so much more than the final product you know or the main piece because a puzzle that has that is missing, you know, that has, let's say you have a puzzle, right? And there's a bunch of small pieces and there's one massive piece, right? If you take away all the small pieces, the puzzle's still incomplete. Yeah. And this is how I think people need to understand business, that even though there's one large piece that makes up and takes up most of the space, and you know, it's a big impact, you know, it, it kind of like, you know, really makes this puzzle what it is. Without those small pieces, that is still not a completed puzzle. So you find it in business, you know, go back to business, people go off by themselves, but they're not ready. Why? Because they needed that manager because that manager was telling them what to do. You can cut hair well, but doesn't mean you know how to run a barbershop. Yeah. Doesn't mean you understand the business side of things. You might cut hair well, but you might have someone behind you who's actually promoting you. They know how to promote, you know how to cut hair. So you make a good unit because it's kind of like, okay, you're going to promote what I'm doing, but I'm going to cut the hair. So, you know, so, I think, you know, people rush off early. And I love to tell, always tell people that, you know, I worked in this shop for like 15 to 16 years. And from those 15 to 16 years, I was managing it for about 10, 11 years. So I studied the game I was in. I didn't just jump at the opportunity, you know, to go open up my own shop. I paid, I, I served that shop. I learned from that shop. I learned in that shop. I, I, I ran the shop. I managed, I did the taxes. I did the admin. I did all of these things there. I learned on the job. Then after 16 years, 15, 16 years, I then went up and opened up my own shop. And the only reason why I opened up my own shop was because it got to a stage where I had all of these ideas of how I wanted a barbershop to run. And I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, live out those ideas in this shop because it's not my shop. And it's not an issue. It's not my shop. You're in someone else's premises. So you live by their rules you abide the laws of the shop that you're in so i was like, okay if i want to run a shop and i feel like i got this vision of how a shop should run then i should go open up my own shop now so i could do those things there because i just feel like if we do these things i i in my head i was like it would be successful it's definitely gonna work right and i tried to do it in that shop but it just wasn't my shop so just i wasn't you know able some of the stuff i was able to do but to the fullness i couldn't do it so you know that i left and you know, i opened up my own shop you know, and I told them, I gave them a free year notice when I started, when I had the idea, I told them that I'm going to, you know, leave and open up my own shop. And I left three years after that. Wow. That, that's very commendable. You gave them a three year notice. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that's right. It wasn't supposed to be a three year notice. It wasn't supposed to be a three year notice. But as soon as I had the idea that I wanted to open up my own shop, I told them that I was going to start searching for a place just to keep everything above board. And I didn't want to be sneaky about anything. So I'm just like, you know, I'm just letting you know from now, this is what I'm doing. So if they decided that they want to kick me out, no problem, you know, but I'm just being honest. That's, that's really commendable of you. And I want to ask, you know, what are some lessons that you learned when I've been seen in 16 years that has shaped you to become the barber that we know today? I learned to cut hair good <laughs> there, you know, that, that's a, you know, that was a great lesson because, you know, I had really good barbers around me and above me. So that was really good. I basically, you know, took all the good things from the barbers I saw around me and I kind of like tried to implement them into my life and go further. So where I saw some of these barbers stopping 
I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to stop there. So if I saw this barber was doing good haircuts, but maybe their customer service was bad, I'd be like, well, I'm going to take the good haircuts, but I'm going to, you know, throw away the bad customer service, you know. But So I just learned, the main thing I think in there was I learned to cut hair well. You know, since then I've progressed um, even further. And I learned basics about, you know, running a business because I was, you know, doing all the admin and all the back-end work and the taxes and paying the bills and so on. So I learned a little piece of running a business there as well. That's good. And I want to add, you know, worse, you know, you mentioned that you took, you, um, you gave your supervisor or the boss of the shop, of the previous shops, three years um, before you opened your own um, barbershop. You know, what were some challenges that you had to face, you know, opening your, your own studio, your own shop? What were some challenges you faced? Some of the challenges I faced when opening up my own shop were money, financial constraints, not having the money to do it to the level which I wanted to do the shop to. So that was difficult. Um, also, finding good builders. The first builder, builders that done my shop didn't finish the job. They took all the money and they just basically ran off of it. So I got robbed for money made things hard because I never had money in the first place. Now I've been robbed. So now I need to find more money. So I had to keep borrowing money, borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. You know, I opened up the shop about five years ago and I'm still paying back money from opening up the shop. So, you know, finances was hard. Also, I think, you know, finding good barbers is difficult. You know, that that's a difficult thing because any good barber most of the time is in a shop already or they're doing their own thing that you know they're not looking to like you know move on so that was difficult as well i think you know money setting up the shop money and finding barbers although to be honest the way i found my barbers i didn't even really put anything out there i just people just kept on messaging me so i had this thing where i said you know once i'm open you know hopefully people start coming by you know because they can see you know i'm working by myself in the shop, you know, I've got all these chairs here, but it's just me. And that happened, you know, people started messaging me, walking by, contacting me, saying, you know, you got a chair, you got a chair, you got a chair. And that's you know, how it happened. That's good. And I, I want to ask, you know, since you're talking about money, um, and this is a money show, you know, how did you, if you could do it over, that's how I say, if you could start this process of, you know, becoming only your own, becoming your own boss, you know, what was some, what was something you would have done different, especially when it comes to like the money? part of like you know sponsoring the business what i'd have done different was i had an assistant at the time so if i put myself back in that situation because you know when you look back in the past you can always say i would have done this i would have done that mm -hmm. but it's not realistic because you're not if you go back in the past you're going to be in the same situation you were, which you were in then not your situation now and i think what i would have done was i would have got my assistant more involved in the building of the shop because I would have got her to write down everything instead so that when they were coming back and saying, oh, you know, we, we haven't done this or we didn't say this, we didn't say that. No, we said this, we said that. I'd be like, no, no, we've got all the notes here. You said this on this date. And so, so I think I would have been, I would have done that. But also I'd have done a more thorough search for proper builders and I would have read reviews and got recommendations and so on instead of just going online and then finding someone who seemed to be good and they weren't. That's good. And I want to ask, how do you go? Um, you know, I know you mentioned that you didn't have to look for barbers, but for anyone who may be in the, maybe in the spot where they're looking for barbers, you know, to fill up their chairs, how would you recommend for them to go about filling up these chairs with good barbers? I would say, you know, um, well, promote yourself, put it out there on social media platforms, everything, you know, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, X, you know, that's what Twitter is now, threads, <laughs> Pinterest, <laughs> Pinterest, LinkedIn, you know, all of them. You know, put yourself out on all of them and, you know, just, you know, keep promoting them regularly. And what I'd say is what I looked for in barbers was, but because I knew I had the skill one to train up barbers, I said when I was looking for barbers that I was looking for people who had the right attitude more than the best barbers. Because a bad attitude is hard to change, but someone who is not the best skilled, but they have a good attitude, we can work on your skills. We can make your skills better. Your attitude is something that is going to be a lot 
more difficult to work on, especially if you don't think you got an attitude or you don't care. Yeah, 100% right on that. And, you know, I want to, you know, uh, ask you know, at this junction, because you mentioned you lost money um, while you was building, um, starting your barbershop, you know, you're still paying back um, some of the money you borrowed. You know, how has your fate, you know, through this process, you know, five years um, building your business has, you know, kept you keep on going and still believing for greater in the future? Well, my faith, my belief, you know, um, is what my business is built on. So when people always ask me, you know, how did I build the business? How did I get it to where it's at right now? I said, it's all built on biblical principles. That's all it is. You know, the vision I had for the shop initially wasn't anything major. It was basic biblical principles. It was like in a community spot, a shop that will help people and reach out to people if they need the help. You know, a shop that has good customer service, a, co a shop that, you know, that we show up on time. You know, we work hard, we're diligent. You know, we just, all the things that we are doing was just based off my faith and my belief system and how I believe I'm supposed to be living. So, you know, so even little things like in cutting hair, I'll be cutting hair. And I'll be like, you know what, I'm late for this next customer or this customer's waiting or, you know, I'm tired right now and I could make this haircut better, but uh, who cares? And what would always convict me would be, you know, I'm like, well, actually, you know, you know, God, you can, you know, you can see what I'm doing. And this is what goes back to the, the scripture of Colossians 3.23, yeah. because the whole thing was in everything you do, do to the best of your ability, like you're working onto God, not human bosses. And I always felt that because I was always like, oh, you know, God is here. So when I don't do something correctly, I know even if the guys here, none of them know, God knows. Yeah. So that's how you know my business was built and developed. It was based on all of those ethics there, you know. Um, and and we're here now. <laughs> thank God. Thank um definitely thank God. Um as we're wrapping up this conversation, I do have a few more conversations, um, a few more questions, but one question I want to ask. Um, and I feel like there's stir up a lot of different um, controversy on social media. It's price. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, it's price. And I want to ask you the first like this. How do you determine the price for your service and how do you communicate the value to your client? Well, the value is shown in what you provide. And if a client wants to leave, then your service isn't that valuable to them. And that's fine. You know, you don't have to convince someone to pay the price you charge. You need to perform your service and let them go out there and see why they should be willing to pay a bit more. So it's never been a thing for me to kind of come, although when we've upped our prices, I have told customers we're upping our prices, I've told them why. But ultimately, if they stay with you, then it's worth it. And if they don't, then it's not worth it to them. And it's, I just see it as that simple, you know, um, yeah, but it should all be in your work that you do as to why they want to stay. You shouldn't be begging people to stay. Okay. And I guess on that, on that same path, you know, being the fact that you do have experience with um, celebrities and things like that. So I know a lot of people, barbers, when they get introduced to like celebrities and celebrities, they pay these high prices for, you know, hair. Yep. Now they want to now charge those celebrities prices onto the average Joe, onto the average man. Do you have separate yeah. with celebrities or how do you go about maintaining your relationship with a celebrity that way they don't feel like you're ripping them off, but you get them the same value as if they were a regular person? And as a regular person, you get them. I don't know if that, if that makes sense. Like the value. It does, it does. No, it does. You know, I charge celebrities the same price as I charge everybody else. People, I've heard people say to me, you know, but they're celebrities, so they should pay more. But I've always said to people, you know, they're like, well, they say they're a celebrity or they're rich, so they should pay more, pay more. But I always say to people, if you walk into a shop right now and there's a chocolate bar there and it says 60p, but they look at you and they say, oh, hold up, you look like you make a lot of money. Or we know, we saw some lists, you make a lot of money. So that chocolate bar is $5 as an example. You never think that's okay. Yeah. So why do we think it's okay to charge someone because they got more money or status, you know, more money. Now, what I always say to people is, because people always come with this argument where they say, well, if they're gonna be spending extra time on their hair because they're celebrities and so on, then they should pay more. And I said, well, they're not paying more. They're just paying 
the adequate price for the service you're offering them. So if a normal haircut costs $30 as an example, and you do an extra long service with special treatment, and you charge $50 as an example, then when that delivery comes in, if they get the extra service and extra treatment and everything like that, well, they're not actually paying more because they're celebrities, they're paying more because they're getting more. Yeah. Anybody else who requests that service can get that as well. So I think is you just charge everyone the price you just charge normally, and they might add extra services on it because if someone wants something extra, charge for that because it's going to take you more time. But you're not now charging someone more because they're a celebrity. You're charging them more because they're getting a service that requires more. Uh, that, 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 that makes sense. That, that definitely makes sense. And you know, I want to ask a question. You know, Since you say you started your business five years ago, I can imagine the pandemic did have an impact on your business in some yeah. way, fashion. And I want to ask, how were you able to still, still retain clients due to the pandemic? I know a lot of barbershops closed, a lot of um, people lost clients because of the lack yeah. of contact. How were you able to still maintain your relationship with your different clients? Well, a few things. One, because some of my clients weren't doing anything during that time, so they didn't, weren't getting any haircuts. So they were waiting for the pandemic to be over and for the shops to open up again. And um, two, I just feel like when you offer a good service and you have a good product, what you would just find is people sometimes will wait it out for that because they've had so much bad experiences with different barbers and so on. When they finally have a good one, they just don't want to ruin that or lose that. So even though I left, you know, we left, I didn't leave. You know, the shop was closed like three, four months. The day we opened back up, all these guys came in with afros. <laughs> you know, they just, they just waited until the shop was back open. So during the pandemic, that's how we kind of dealt with that. And then also just the way we kept going, just because I took out loans. Wow. Just, just took out loans so I could pay the, you know, the rent for the shop while we weren't there. We were still getting electricity bill, water rates, and so on. So I guess I took out loans because it's business. And yeah. that's what I always tell people. Like business isn't easy. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's hard. It's life, you know. So I took out loans, and those loans paid my bills while we weren't there. But now I'm still paying back those loans, <laughs> you know, two, three years on. To keep the business open, people don't realize the amount of money it costs. But, you know, this is business. Yeah, hundred percent right. And you know, I want to ask you know, after doing all your different experience, what would you say is the most rewarding or I guess highlight of your career as a barber? You know, started from fourteen all the way to like thirty plus now. What would it be the highlight of your barbering career? I think there's a couple. One was opening up my shop. That was one highlight. You know, definitely. Another was I won this business award. And that was a really a big one because I was up against really big people. So I really appreciate that. That was a highlight of my career. And another thing that was a highlight would be, I think it's collectively, just sometimes some of the conversations I've had with clients and then seeing them taking that, taking on what I had said to them and it had helped them in their lives, whether it's you know, better them or stay out of certain problems and, you know, whatever it was, you know, when you see them take that on and you see a shift in their life, those are proud moments because it's like, okay, and those are like private proud moments because it's not like you can shout about it and say, hey guys, look, I advise this person and look at him now, you know, but <laughs> they're little, you know, moments in your heart where you're like, oh, that's really nice and that's really good to see that, you know, you've changed your life around and it's because, you know, and I played a part in that. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, the conversation that you have with your client, because that kind of leads me to my last question. You know, how do you manage your time effectively um, with maintaining a career and your personal relationships? Because I can imagine some of these relationships you have with your clients, you know, does turn into personal relationships. and then that's, But how do you make sure that you're not losing on business, but you may spend 45 an hour on one client, but you have this many people waiting? So how do you make sure to keep that time balanced? Well, you spend less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one or the haircut, but no, I do like all appointments. So you generally put a time out there which takes you. What's the average time it takes you to cut hair? Then you kind of like add on five to ten minutes after that, and charge people for that time there, and then you get your clients to come in. 
and you know, you know, average takes you let's say half an hour to cut hair. So if you've got 42 minutes um, to cut someone's hair, then you've got to have maybe a lot of haircuts, you know, the spare 10 minutes. You know, and maybe a client comes in and they do take a bit longer and they take 40 minutes, you know, well, you've accounted for that because you've added on a bit of time. But then some clients might come and it's their quick haircuts, which takes 20 minutes. So then you just start finding, okay, even when you're running behind a little bit, you are balancing it up because that haircut's 20 minutes, this haircut's 35 minutes. So that's kind of how basically where you manage your time. And then you just got to say, you know, if you're fully booked all the time, tell people you don't take walk-ins anymore. And the reason why you don't take them is just because you haven't got any space because you're fully booked. Yeah. So um, I think that's it's just about being honest as well to people, just letting them know, you know, I can do this, I can't do that, I'm doing appointments, I'm not doing any walk-ins, and so on. Just letting the client know where they stand. And I want to ask you, I know you have, um, you know, you're married and you have children. So how do you make sure your, your career as a barber, you know, trying to sell doesn't conflict with, you know, with your personal relationships and with family? I try to keep them separate through not bringing the problems from barbering home. And then I try to also integrate them, meaning like so much, so many times my children have been on call outs with me. Like the other day, my daughter, she's she's newborn, she's um six months old. Congrats. I think she's about thank you. She's about three months old. And I cut this guy he's from America. He's um I mean I won't say his name, but he's I guess he's massive. I guess he's like he's like a music manager, he does all this other stuff now. He's managed some of the biggest, I guess, musicians. His name when I heard I was cutting, I'd heard his name loads of times. I just didn't know who he was. But I was like, you know, um, I go cut his hair. I said, okay, cool, you know, I'll cut his hair. But they got to know that I'm going to be with my daughter. So I always tell people this, you know, so that's why I mean I integrate it. It's kind of like, you know, I kind of come sometimes with a package. So my <laughs> daughter's going to be with me. So if he's cool with that, no problem. You know, I went to his hotel, my daughter was there. She was crying a little bit. I had to rock her throughout the haircut a bit and, you know, but I basically, what I'm saying is I integrate where I can. You know, I've had my oldest son when he was a baby on my back while I was cutting hair. I've taken him out on the call outs. He's been on set. You know, all these things there, you know, just because um, I think it's really important to make sure that I'm not neglecting my family for the sake of providing for my family. Mm. So I always say, you know, you got to make sure that your priorities are actually your priorities. So if one of my priorities, you know, to spend time with my family is to, you know, raise my children, to be in their lives and so on. So if you ask me to come and give you a haircut, you know, and you're willing to pay the price, I'm like, oh, yeah, one more thing, though. You say, you know, my sons are going to be with me. You know, my sons have been on stage with me a couple of times. I've had my sons fighting on stage over a lollipop or something like that behind me while I'm cutting hair on stage. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> wow. but, you know, but they're... But they're there with me, you know. They're there with me, you know. So they're here with me. You know? So I just bring them along the journey. That's good. And I definitely want to say thank you very much, Mr. Mark, for your time. You know, I know it's late at night. You know, thank you for taking time today. But I do have one question. Um, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years as a barber, as a man of God, as a family man? Where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? In the next five years? Um, in the next five years, I see myself... I'm not sure there's a few things which I'm trying to do right now. So I guess, you know, maybe doing a bit more business teaching because I like I like to teach people about business. So maybe in four years, five years, more business teaching, maybe another book out there. Products I'll be selling, you know, hair shampoos and wave creams and so on, which I'm, you know, right now in the process of making, come towards the end of it. Um, and working still in the barbershop, but probably like less days. That's really good. That's really good. Definitely want to say thank you. And if you can leave any word for any barber, any hairdresser, what would that word of wisdom be? Forever remain a student of your craft. If you want to master your craft, you must forever remain a student of your craft. Thank you very much. And I hope for those who are listening, I hope you guys don't see us another entrepreneur, another guest on our Welcome Prize show. I hope this inspires you and encourages you to take action today. And see you guys next week and remain blessed, guys. Thank you again, Mr. Mark. No problem.